Welcome to this video on nuclear fusion reactors, part of the particles and waves topic for higher physics. What we're looking at in this video is we're looking at details of the nuclear fusion reactors. We're looking at the challenges of achieving nuclear fusion and how we contain the plasma for nuclear fusion and how we heat it up and how we cool it down. So what is nuclear fusion? Well, nuclear fusion is when two small nuclei combine to give a larger nucleus. This is the process that takes place in stars and the sun, initially starting with hydrogen nuclei fusing together to make helium. And then larger nuclei will then fuse together. So helium and helium will fuse together to make heavier elements. And stars will do that normal main sequence stars will do that until they reach iron. There is a requirement to have very high temperatures and pressures to overcome the repulsion between the protons in the nuclei because they're both positive charge and to get them close enough that the strong force will overcome this and they will fuse together and that's the big challenge for nuclear fusion. So we will recall that when the nuclei fuse together, the final mass of the products is less than the initial mass, the mass of the reactants. And it's this difference in mass that is changed into energy using the famous equation, energy equals mass times speed of light squared. Okay, so there we had an animation showing the isotopes of hydrogen fusing together to make helium. So we've got hydrogen 2, also known as deuterium, and hydrogen 3, known as tritium. So that's ju for 2 and tri for 3, fusing together to make helium nucleus or an alpha particle. And for conservation of mass, there's also a neutron ejected and we get energy produced from this reaction because we have a difference in mass between the products and the reactants that we've got. Um, the actual process in stars is slightly more tricky than this. This is a simplification, but for higher physics, that is sufficient for us to know. For those of you going on to advanced higher physics, we'll come back to this then. Um, you don't need to be familiar with the particular names of the uh, reactants here, although it doesn't do any harm to know them. So there's lots of research over the past 50, 60 years looking at nuclear fusion and the ways that nuclear fusion can be harnessed to provide energy. Um, there's an ongoing joke within the fusion industry that um, the greatest step and the breakthrough within fusion is going to take place within the next 10 years. And scientists have been saying this for 20, 30, 40 years. Um, things are getting closer, but there's still some challenges remaining to make commercially viable nuclear fusion reactors. So let's have a look at a nuclear fusion reaction reactor. So this is the JET reactor, it stands for Joint European. So being uh, contributed by European countries and Taurus and Taurus is the shape. It's what we call a toroidal shape, which looks pretty much like a donut. And this is at the Harwell Laboratories in Oxfordshire, where this has been made and operating since hmm, I haven't looked it up, but I would imagine about 1980s, that kind of time. And in this device, we react the small nuclei, the deuterium and the tritium, and at one over 100 million Kelvin. When it's that hot, 
we get plasma. And plasma is often described as the fourth state of matter in addition to solids, liquids, and gases. And at those temperatures, the gas is ionized. And so we have the positive ions, the nuclei of the hydrogen and free electrons. And this is th thought to be one of the most common states of matter within the universe and may explain other things like dark matter, um, but certainly is the state of matter within stars. For us to su sustain fusion, we need three conditions to take place. We need really high temperatures, so we're talking 200 million Kelvin. We need a particular confinement time and we need the plasma to be really quite dense, to be close enough together that it will fuse together. Okay, so here's a picture that shows us how the plasma is contained. So the plasma being charges is contained in a magnetic field. And we need that because although the temperatures of the materials are still very high, we couldn't contain them in normal materials, it's just too hot. So we have this toroidal, this donut shaped helical magnetic field that contains the charged particles within it. And this is obviously a real challenge to um, produce a sufficient field and to be able to contain the plasma that's dense enough and hot enough for the reactions to take place. So we use very large, very powerful magnetic fields in this toroid or donut-like shape. So this allows it to be heated to 150 million degrees without touching the walls, because although we can make materials that will cope with high temperatures, they certainly don't cope with temperatures this high. So if you're a bit further away, then you can uh, cope with materials that can cope with higher temperatures if you cool them down sufficiently without changing state and vaporizing. So how do they heat up to get to these temperatures? Well, they use radio frequencies. They use electromagnetic radiation to heat it up. And you get what's called ohmic heating. So you get a current, a flow of charges flowing through the plasma and that produces its own type of heating. So it takes a lot of energy to operate the nuclear fusion reactor. And that's the challenge, is that the amount of energy that we put in at the moment is greater than we get from the yield because of the because of these situations. So we're trying to make the reaction more efficient and better so that we can get more energy out than we put in. Okay, so we apply a magnetic field to the plasma ions and we get a current. And we get high energy particles are injected in. So because they're moving, they've got kinetic energy, they've got heat. And we heat up with radio frequency waves that vibrate the particles and make them hot. So here are some pictures showing um, the temperatures. I think these are sort of infrared pictures of it. And you can see the shape of the, of the fields. So how will a power station work? Well, the hydrogen plasma will be squeezed together so that we get our helium. So those high temperatures and pressures and the strong force causing the uh, nucleons to join together. And then what will happen is there'll be a heat exchanger, which will take out the heat and transfer it into water. And the water will turn to steam and the steam will turn the turbine and the turbine will turn the generator. So the process will be very similar to most power stations. In the majority of power stations, what we're doing is we're taking the heat energy and we're heating up water and water's turning to steam and steam's turning the turbine. It's just how that heat is produced. So in this case, from a nuclear fusion reaction, at the moment we do nuclear fission reactions in our nuclear power stations. Or we burn fossil fuels, such as 
coal or oil or gas. In the UK, mostly gas. What are the advantages? Well, big advantage is the fuel can come from seawater. The deuterium and tritium are within the seawater. There is little radioactive waste produced. And we'll see in a minute that what is produced has short half-lives as well. We can control the reaction really easily. If it's not hot enough, fusion won't take place. And it's really easy to not be hot enough. So the deuterium is extracted from seawater. The tritium is made in a reactor from lithium, which is one of the really common elements. And to give you an idea, the laptop batteries would have lithium in, as would your phone. Most batteries are lithium ion batteries. And so if we take one laptop battery and the deuterium in 100 liters of water, that would be enough for a normal electricity user to last for 30 years. So if we can crack this, there is real, real potential. Okay, tritium is radioactive, but it's low energy beta particles have a short half-life, just 12 years. And the reaction emits neutrons, but they can be absorbed by the vessel walls. So the vessel itself is only weakly radioactive for around about 10 years. And that's much shorter compared to nuclear fission radioactive waste, which can have half-lives of hundred year, hundreds of years, in which case we need to keep them for thousands of years. We can stop the fusion reaction easily by cutting the fuel supply, stopping the heating, or if there's any damage to the walls, it won't contain it. Um, there's nothing really too much that can get out. It just won't do the heating uh, and won't be close enough together. Okay, so we set out to have some understanding of the nuclear fusion reaction. It's toroidal shaped donut that there's plasma within it and that we need high pressures and temperatures for the reaction to take place.